town in the Rossendale Valley in Lancashire. Haslingdon High School is a large comprehensive on the outskirts of the town, a school which can trace its history back to the beginning of the century. Jenny Mills takes past pupils back to their school to discover the old school ties. The thing I hated people to say when I was a kid, that uh, kids these days don't know they're born. And when I look at all this stuff here, I'm inclined to say that kids these days don't know they're born. This is fantastic, isn't it, Jim, really? When you think... Bill Malcolm, Jim Maguire, Grace Hopes, Anne Pilling, Barry Woolley and Barry Dobson all attended Haslingdon Grammar School between the late 1940s and the early 1960s. In education, it was a time of excitement and optimism. But in the Rossendale Valley, people were beginning to realise that a more worrying change was on its way. It would be about 51 onwards, I think. There was a lot of short time in the cotton mills, in the slipper factories too, there was short time. And I can remember parents of several people in our year being on short time, and money was pretty tight. But I can remember several people saying, you lot are lucky, being in grammar schools, because you won't have to put up with short time in factories. I can remember my first morning very vividly. I'd come from a small primary school only a hundred yards further down the road. And I can remember forlornly thinking of my friends that I'd left behind. And they'd been scattered, you know, to the four winds going to other secondary schools. And I was just one of two going to the grammar school. And I can remember running my ruler along the uh, wrought iron railings and making a rat-a-tat-tat and feeling very, very small against this, what I thought was an enormous building. But in point of fact, it was a relatively small school, only about 350 in the school altogether. Walking up Pleasant Street to the school, I was very, very conscious of the sound, or lack of sound, of this crowd of people walking up the street. Although there were voices, there was something missing sound-wise, because when we went to the village school, the sound that one heard was the sound of clogs on pavements, and everyone going up to grammar school was in shoes. Mm. But I was very conscious myself of the squelch of crepe soled shoes and I felt really very, very posh, and I had a hat on. And it, my hat was the most extraordinary hat imaginable. It, was, it seemed very expensive, and it was the first time I had ever had a new hat. And it was a very, almost like a bucket, I think, the crown of it was so deep, and it was this dark blue with the band on. And I had this hat, and I was worried about, would anybody steal my hat at school? Because I thought it was very, very smart. Although when I see pictures <laughs> now, I'm a cast. <coughs> but that hat mattered a lot, and the fact that I was in shoes. And there was a very strange <coughs> smell. And sometimes I can still smell that smell. I don't know what it was. Perhaps it was something to do with a pile of coke outside the annex, which we had to walk round. And I remember these two girls who'd also come from the village with me. They were put into the other group. And... They went into their group, and I was in the next door room, and I can remember this terrible feeling. I, I was absolutely bereft. I was completely, for the first time in my life, surrounded by strangers. The uniform was something I just wasn't used to, especially this horrible hat. <laughs> <laughs> I hated it, and I hated it the whole time I was at school. And <laughs> I always got one that seemed to be too big, you know, and it seemed to come down over my ears, and... I just couldn't stand the thing, and I, I wouldn't put it on, and I can remember being told off almost immediately I got to the station because there were prefects there, you see, to kind of show us the way, put your hat on, that sort of thing, and that was a big bug for me the whole of the time I was there. When we eventually got to school, I, I can remember feeling very sorry that my friend wasn't with me because she hadn't passed her 11 plus. You know, I felt separated. The first week, we seemed to be spending all our time backing books, getting books organised in these little satchels you used to have, trying to find different ways of fitting them in. And then you get organised in all the various rules of the school. There were endless rules for almost every occasion. 
or in school, the way you conducted yourself, the way you spoke to teachers, the way you entered rooms, exited rooms, the rules of the road and corridors. You always have to walk on the right if I remember correctly, otherwise you have enormous traffic jams. The way you conduct yourself in the playground, how you should behave in the street, on the buses. I mean, you can have a rule for every occasion. In actual fact, most of these sort of stay with you. And you find yourself teaching your children the same sort of rules and manners and behaviour. One of the rules was that you didn't eat fish and chips in the street, wasn't it? Ice cream, you didn't eat ice cream in the street. I've never really <coughs> understood that one. I didn't dare cheek the staff because I was so frightened of what was going to happen if I was spoken to by the headmaster, never mind looked at. He only had to glare at you mm. and you were shaking in your shoes. He used to look over his glasses at you and you used to really freeze. But today, the children don't have this fear. They seem to have a respect for the staff, but they don't have a fear of them. And that's good in a sense. I was lucky I didn't have many problems. I was able to cope with the work, I enjoyed the sports, I, was, I had a happy time at school. I think if I'd had problems, I don't know that the teachers would have been the ones I'd have turned to in that sort of situation. I don't think uh, it was a cowed sort of uh, discipline where people shrank into the paintwork. Now, I was a rather naughty boy, you know, at school, but never once, never once in my six years at school did anyone lay a finger on me. And I was taken to one side and spoken to firmly by, you know, one or two members of staff, and I think, uh, you know, they put me right. I was uh, hit by various teachers. I was caned. I probably deserved to be caned. I think that uh, a lot of the good hidings, though, from uh, teachers were probably not appropriate. The classic to me was uh, a boy standing in front of me waiting to go in a lesson. The senior mistress came by and stopped and looked at this boy and smacked him across the face and she said, now you know what that's for, don't you? And he said, yes, miss. And after she'd walked away, I said, good God, what was that for? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> but he'd got more sense than to say that he didn't know what it was for. And um, one or two of the teachers, not a great number of them, but one or two of them certainly went well over the top in this regard. Maybe I was just unlucky, I don't know. I remember Bill, and Bill always used to make people laugh. And you were a scrappy little lad, that's weren't true. you? Well, that's he true. was a well, scrappy yeah. little lad. That's and uh, <laughs> I think he was the sort of snotty nosed little kid that uh, perhaps uh, some adults felt, well, you know, I can sort of give him a clip round the ear. Didn't and, uh, fit the image. I can remember particularly one, one lesson, we were in, in the fifth year. The teacher went off, he was called out to something. In no time at all, we were in uproar because Bill was singing, giving us a song. He was singing the flea song. Ah, flea, ah, ah, flea. Mm. And he was singing this, and he had everyone <laughs> singing this. But, he, you know, we were really giving it our all. The boys up to the third year had to wear short pants. It was quite ludicrous because there were some quite large, you know, third years that really did look silly in short pants. I was five foot nine and 15 years old before I could shed uh, <laughs> short pants mm -hmm. and chains and for long trousers. I think, uh, generally speaking, most people would wear the full uniform without uh, any complaint and uh, probably initially, certainly, with some pride, I think, you know, they looked at a polished badge and, uh, you know, they were quite pleased about that. But it was this ridiculous school cap, you know, that even, uh, I think, great big six warmers had to wear in my day. Mm -hmm. It was totally disliked by the boys, <coughs> and one of the ways of expressing this dislike was the initiation ceremony associated with the caps. So these caps, apart from the red stripes, had a little enamel badge sewn onto the front, carefully by your mother, beautiful and pristine when you walked into school. And on the first day, somebody, somewhere, would sneak up, grab your cap, bash it against the wall, and chip your badge for you. <laughs> terrible smell after gym lessons. 
the smell of perspiration in the cloakroom because we just did gym in our navy knickers and ordinary school blouses and then you just took your gym slip off and went down the corridor to the gym and then you came back and you put your gym slip back on again and if you know you can just imagine sort of 20 odd adolescent girls having been energetic I don't know what the boys cloakroom must have been like but the girls was pretty awful Lingwell is at mid on at mid off is Morris at cover Harvey and uh, at short third man Miller once again and he's out caught by Graham Hull Remember once, it was the summer term, this was before we actually had school props as a uniform, we just wore our gym slips and blouses right through the year, and there was a test match on, somebody had a, a battery radio, and we wanted to listen to this test match, so we decided that um, we could listen to it, providing somebody could secrete it up the gym slip, and so uh, sitting in class with this radio up the gym slip, and we had it turned up quite loud listening to this, we were all listening, or the whole form listening to it and the teacher trying to teach us French was going around and he could hear this and he got very close to the desk where it was and of course he looked in the satchel and it wasn't there and he looked in somebody else's satchel and it wasn't there and he lifted the desk lids and it wasn't there and I rather suspect that he thought he knew where it was but couldn't do much about it. Where are you, Mr. Chapitre Hermshaw? Where are you, Mr. Truth Hermshaw, if you like? In the northwest of Angleterre. I felt ashamed this morning when I saw those children all labouring, but I also felt that they, they were being stimulated so much more. It was so much more relevant than our lessons had been. We did very little oral work at all until A-level French. Um, mainly grammar, um, board work, exercises, en route, en marche, and uh, that was it. And they were, they were very tedious, and very few people took French at A-level. At one stage, we had a master who really did try. He was our form master, too, and we liked him. And he brought records of uh, Jean Sablon and various other uh, French singers. And he used to have us singing. We used to have sing-alongs, which we did. And I, I can remember several of us standing on the desk lids and tap dancing to the music. And this poor man, we used to call, uh, he just didn't know quite what to do at all. Uh, uh, because we... We, we just were running riot. I characterise it as the University of Haslington. It had a very heavy academic atmosphere to it. The thing that I remember uh, about my early days at the school is all the staff going round in gowns. Mm. It seemed very appropriate to the kind of school that it was. The teaching was very formal people lined up in, a, in an almost drilled-like way. Everything about the school somehow smacked of formality. And I thought this formal air was epitomised most strongly in speech day, when really it must have been a most impressive occasion when everybody was drilled all afternoon to silently file into the appropriate place in the hall. And then at a signal from the headmaster, really dramatic just like something in a film, the headmaster takes off his mortarboard and the whole school sits silently. All these children just sitting like that at one go. Marvellous, really. But would it be appropriate to the 1980s, you know? I, I just don't know. Councillor Alden, uh, Mr Marshall, Deputy Mayor and Mayoress, uh, staff of Hazen High School, parents and pupils. Um. At speech nights, the senior boys in the school, usually situated at the back, uh, used to run a book. We all used to put so much in the kitty. And whoever got nearest to the length of time that the main speaker spoke uh, in terms of minutes and seconds won, won the kitty. So this was part of the tradition of speech night, year after year. Amir Shah... David Taylor, Bruce Tweedale, Claire Whelan, Jonathan Woodward. The school concentrated to a great extent, exclusively in my view, on academic achievement. And if you weren't in the top half dozen in your class, I felt that it was very hard. 
we were put into this frame, this habit of learning. We got used to <coughs> doing so much homework every night or whatever. You were amongst a group of people who were bright. The whole thing was calculated to accelerate your progress. I think that uh, the people who didn't go to the grammar school, who went to the secondary one, to some extent missed on this. They also, of course, missed out on a foreign language. They missed out on Latin as well. This meant that, as, as regards higher education, almost, you could say, not entirely, but almost, the door, for instance, to university, the door to training college, was closed on all those people at 11. I felt uh, a lot of my friends at 11 were failures, because that's how it was classified. You passed or you failed. Whilst I was at school, I remember one boy joining our class from the secondary modern school, and that was it in the whole of the time I was there. We were all right, Jack, but it was hard luck on the others. Quite often when we were going home, especially if we'd stayed on for something a bit later after school, we would be ambushed by a group of kids from St Mary's. What do you call technical bulldogs and this sort of thing? They used to throw stones at us and all something. I remember once being actually chased through one of the houses from the front door through, <laughs> through the back door in Pleasant Street. Yes. There were two double decker buses, I think, or, or I think three that used to go down to Ewood Bridge, and that was only about a three mile journey. But during this three mile journey, I understand that uh, one or two boys were occasionally debagged and their trousers hung through the window as a flag. I think the time when, I, when it used to happen the most was in the winter, yeah. when there was snow. Mm -hmm. And I think then that the, the rivalry used to come from St. Mary's suddenly mm -hmm. decided that they would all charge round <coughs> to Haslam Grammar School to throw snowballs at everybody in the schoolyard. And if that was done in morning break, then certainly there would be retaliation in the afternoon break from the husband and grammar school people all charging around there to throw snowballs at them. I can remember sitting, uh, having my lunch one day and uh, there was a raid going on, a snowball raid, and one snowball came hurtling through the window, hit me straight between the eyes and ended up on my dinner. <laughs> First of all, we're putting in rolled oats, porridge oats, which are very rich in fibre. Fibre is good for us because it helps clean out our insides, doesn't it? It scrubs us out, if you like. And well, let's go back to my days at school, of course, boys never had this kind of teaching at all. And the class I was in this morning was 50% boys, 50% girls, which I think is ideal. It gives them a, a more rounded understanding of their, their health and nutrition, but also being able to look after themselves. But were you then surprised to see what they were eating at lunchtime? Absolutely. Horrified, to be honest, at what was on offer there. I need some potato pie, I'll have the mushy peas, and uh, I'll have some chips, please. I noticed the baked beans, but uh, no thanks. Uh, the memories are too, uh, too severe of baked beans. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like a Yes, please, a bit of gravy on the potato pie. Thanks very much. Good old thrombostic chocolate uh, pudding and custard. I'm going to try that for old. I'll try that for old. I'll try it for old times' sake. <laughs> My God, some things never change, do they? <laughs> oh, wonderful! This yogurt's new, though. You you certainly wouldn't have had yogurt and this cheese and biscuits out of this world. Look here, we've even got sandwiches. Choice of sandwiches. They don't know they're born. I think the food that we had at school was much better than what we had today. We very rarely got chips. We always had mashed potato or boiled potatoes. Homemade food. It wasn't bought in. It was nourishing and it was well balanced. If they go to the canteen now, we saw a great big tray of chips and a very tiny tray of boiled potatoes and if children are given the choice they will eat chips we weren't we weren't given a choice and um, our generation i'm sure won't have the problems that this next generation are going to have health-wise i recall actually that the food by and large was was good and when it became bad we complained about it 
and nothing was done and we complained again and nothing was done and then we decided that we'd have a strike and we brought sandwiches and uh, the headmaster brought in the school meals organiser. We were complaining about fatty food, very, very fatty meat and fatty stews and so on. And she said, believe me, young woman, if you get pneumonia, you'll be very grateful that you've had plenty of fat because you'll survive it. But if you think you can cut fat out of your diet, you'll die. But the, the food improved. Below me, the wall on the roadway to the harbour car park has vanished. And it was here, right in the centre of the town, that the Lynn River suddenly changed its course on Friday night, for it swung away from West I, th I think we were very fortunate, actually, in, particularly in English lessons. We had some very lively teachers. I think it was 1953, was it, in the winter of 53, when there was very severe flooding and, and high gales. And I remember writing poems and stories triggered off by this. And then I can also remember Stalin's death, discussing this in class and speculating about all sorts of things in connection with it. There were educational visits, there was a chess club, there was a film society, there was a debating club. The headmaster himself used to have what would be the equivalent of today's general studies, where he took the sixth form in the library and introduced them to the great artists and the great composers. School for me was the place where I, if you like, discovered myself. We ran the houses, we organised socials, we organised dances. That, for me, was an opening of doors. But also, the widest door that opened was the theatre, the opera, concerts, speaking to people in, in a foreign language. All those things, I think, were more important gifts to me from the school than the academic. I felt that because I'd gone to Haslington Grammar School, I was able to enrich the life of other members of the family and my parents. My mother was, was very talented artistically. She had won a scholarship to an art school, but she'd been left in a children's home and her grandfather had taken her and her brothers and sisters out to work on his farm. And so when she got this scholarship, he said, oh, well, no, obviously you can't take it because we need you on the farm. So my mother was determined that if any of her children had any ability, they would use it. And, and I think concerts, dramatic societies, libraries. My mother learned about all these things in a way through what Arnold Weston did for me. In the sisters, people were inward looking in the valley and in the town. The motorway link up wasn't then established or even possibly thought of. And therefore, we tended to be, I suppose, a little insular in many ways. And these opportunities to go to the theatre in Manchester, to go to the Yorkshire Dales, to go to the Lake District, to go to Mellon, really were broadening our education tremendously. I went on several other expeditions up into the Yorkshire Dales. I was paid for by the school for that. I can remember this wonderful sense of seeing this marvellous limestone scenery and it really brought geography to life for me. It, it was an eye-opener, a world-opener really, because it, it just made us realise that there was somewhere else besides Accrington and Haslingdon. You're going to take a piece of cellulose tubing, that's lift up, and it's accessed as a very permeable membrane. Now Mrs. Vett is kindly I can remember wanting to study biology, but our school didn't offer it. And I heard the reason was that Mr. Weston didn't put it on the curriculum because he didn't believe that boys and girls should be taught about the workings of the body together. Whether that's true, I really don't know, but that's what I heard. Certainly the school didn't offer biology nor really sex education. I remember Mr. Weston talking to us about the fact that um, males were very, very excited by the things that they saw and females were very excited by touch 
and therefore this must influence our relationships. And that was sex education. <laughs> and we all sat there very po-faced and uh, didn't utter. The subject was never raised again. <laughs> I do believe that we were brought up to respect the opposite sex. Mm. At Christmas time, we had a, a dance or a party, and one was expected to invite a partner mm. and uh, to treat the girl that you chose in a respectful and well-mannered way, and to look after her during the course of the evening. So I think if that is sex education, it came across in that way, in terms of mutual respect for each other. All the boys were spoken to, weren't they, mm -hmm. about how they should behave towards their girl, getting the girl's supper for her, mm -hmm. and seeing that all the girls were served before mm -hmm. the boys had their supper. If a boy wanted to ask a girl to dance, they had to follow a procedure. I had to walk up and say, please, would you have this dance with me? And if they didn't say that and um, someone overheard, they would be told off about it. It was really quite strict. It seems very, very old-fashioned now and sort of so long ago that you went and did this formal dancing around the floor and there were members of staff there around, you know, watching and all the rest of it. It just seems so, so old-fashioned. And yet, in a way, an awful lot of the kind of curriculum to do with values, for want of a better expression, was done by implication, was done by example. Mr. Weston one day said to me, he said, you know, I would hate to put a notice saying, keep off the grass. He said, but I would love to put a notice saying, gentlemen will keep off the grass. Finally, the Ken Wish Prize for Endeavour has been awarded to Kimberly Ellis. Kimberly. Although it was heavily geared towards academic success, there was never any guidance given as to which path you should follow as regards a career or what you were going to do after you actually achieved your O levels or your A levels. And I don't think there was sufficient preparation for what came after school. Certainly, I had a shock when I started work, because for five years, I had felt that the achievement of gaining my O levels was that that was it, I finished. Uh, and I had a great shock when I started work, to actually find that it wasn't the finish, it was the start, that they had to start at the bottom again. I never liked Latin lessons. But I do remember three Latin words, and that was the school motto. It went something like, Labor omniae vincit, which translated means, labour conquers all. And I think that was certainly instilled into us. If you didn't work hard for something you wanted, you didn't get it. I, I never envisaged ever going to university. None of my family had been. This was something that was just a dream, really, and I went. It really was the first rung on the ladder, and I think even as a young child you were aware of it. I can remember people saying to me in the middle of a conversation, Ah, oh, yes, but you have a future. And it does make you wonder, looking back, just what all those other people who didn't pass the 11 plus, what they felt about it all. I felt privileged to be there. I was proud of that school. The things that I learnt there have enriched my life greatly and it's been marvellous, a marvellous opportunity. And perhaps it would have been a good thing if that same opportunity had been given to every child in the town.
The Old School Ties was presented by Jenny Mills and produced at Pebble Mill by Sarah Rowlands.